This morning we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And this um, passage comes up not for any special reason. And maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it's obvious that I, I don't need to say that, but we're preaching through this book and it's the reason that I believe it's a good idea to preach through large passages of scripture because sometimes when we cherry pick spots, um, we would skip over books like this. <laughs> and not because they aren't true, not because they aren't helpful, but um, just because they're kind of difficult to hear. And so I'd like to just read the chapter. It's a short chapter, just 12 verses, and, and then um, bring you what, what I believe God is saying to us about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Now remember, we have to think, what was the question that Paul is answering? And the question in this case is that it has been reported to Paul that a person in the church, um, an actively um, working member of that body, um, is apparently um, living with his stepmother. <laughs> And we don't believe the stepmother is a member of the church. That's assuming something. But remember, at this time, it's not only just about men anymore, that the woman would have also been called out as, as doing something wrong. And that's why um, people who study this passage believe that, that the man is a member of the church. And remember, there's only one church of Jesus Christ in Corinth. Just like there's really one church here in the whole world, but think about it. If at Little Faith Assembly of God we had this happening and we said, okay, out of here, buddy, he could just go to the church down the road. There's plenty of churches. It wouldn't have the same intensity of meaning. Right. Also, Paul is answering this question after time has gone by, we don't know how much time, but Paul wasn't really close and he had heard about it. So it has been allowed to exist, to occur, to go on in the church and nothing's been done about it that would have been short of just saying, you're just gonna have to go. So instead, Paul is coming in with a solution 
that would not be the instant any time you saw someone um, heading toward the situation that you just say, out of here, we aren't going to tolerate you. There should have been many steps that had occurred with people who knew about the situation to speak truth into the brother's life and say, I don't think you want to go there. But that apparently had not happened. They were, um, as many people are today, thinking that the church needs to be friendly, that if we are um, hard on people, they will just leave and then they won't get a chance to hear about Jesus. And, and they might be, as this says so um, sharply, delivered over to Satan. They might lose out with the Lord, so why would we want to do that? A difficulty arises whenever we, as the church, even the little bit of the church that's here, look the other way and pretend we don't notice when someone who is our brother or sister in Christ is heading into serious error. This one happens to be sexual immorality, but you see he mentions other things in the passage, not, not that that's what he's calling out, but he's putting right alongside here um, other things, even just being greedy or, or swindler, someone who's dishonest, you know, in your, the way that you um, deal with people with money or assets or something. And, and there's difficulty whenever we do that, it allows the person to believe that it's fine. And it's the trick of the devil to have them continue to be able to come in and worship and feel the presence of God and feel kind of lifted in their spirit and think, you know what, I'm fine. We see it also not just in, in church members, but in um, kind of high profile Christian leaders. You often wonder how could they have gotten to the point that they have done whatever sin we hear reported on the news and in the newspaper and splashed all over. And we wonder, well, how could they have done that? How they did it is the people in their life who they should have been held accountable to were cowardly <laughs> and never said, um, you know, I just, I really sense that you're getting into trouble there and I'd like to pray with you about that. So not an instant just, I'm not, associating with you, which is on the surface how some churches have taken this. Some churches have, once we find out that you've sinned, we call you up in front and say leave, and they've used this as a recipe for um, a lot of hurt and disaster. It was often in the past used with young women who were found to be pregnant. They'd march them up in front and kick them out in front of everyone. And that's not what Paul is doing here, although you could take that um, to mean this is what Paul did in this situation, and so you should always do likewise. Really, though, to get around in front of what he's calling them to do first, it should have been dealt with right along. And he is literally saying to um, do this in Corinth, and I believe in that situation, this would have been a powerful, difficult thing for this man who had apparently believed that what he was doing was fine. Now you could also say he was of a pagan culture where they were much looser about morals than Jewish Israelite people were, t were um, of the nature of being. If you look back in Leviticus chapter 18, and I'm not going to read that to you today, but it just lists down every imaginable immorality sexually that you could be involved in and, and calls it right out. And remember, Paul had stayed with these people for a couple of years and taught them, here's the deal, this is what God expects of you. So as the Holy Spirit would prompt someone's heart to say, is that really what you want to do? If they look to their culture, they might think, oh, that's not such a big deal, I'm sure God understands. But Paul calls this something that even pagans <laughs> would not tolerate. And we don't know if his father was living or not living. We, there, we don't have that kind of detail, and I don't know that it's helpful to speculate. But in this situation, Paul is recognizing this as something that that entire church would all really think, no, not right to do that. And 
they were just looking the other way and, and acting like no big deal. So we need to think about that um, as we're going forward, as we're growing, and we need to be brave about it and not um, because in our society it is very common nowadays for um, young people to give it a try, you know, and live together. They don't want to have the encumbrance of a um, marriage that's difficult to get out of. You know, in, in the Jewish culture at this time, all a man had to do in front of two witnesses is say to his wife, I divorce you, and it was done. There was no hiring a lawyer or paying any money or, or paying money forevermore. Or it, it was much different than we have today, and I think that that's part of what causes people to get into very casual, let's just try this out and see if it works kind of thing. There are also financial um, reasons that people lose a lot of money if they are um, single and decide to remarry and are, are getting social security benefits or you know that sort of thing if they're at the end of their life it, it forces many older people to live together rather than get married because they give up a lot of money i'm not justifying any of that i'm just saying the society that we live in is set up to entice people to do things that you might not think about who might say to you well what do you think about that i couldn't even afford to pay my expenses if i marry this man that I really love and so don't you think it's okay before God for us to just commit together and say you know we're committed to one another isn't that okay and you maybe ask that <laughs> I get asked that and you might be asked that and and it's important that you pray about that and get get real with God about that and say well what what should my answer be we know that the devil will use any little toehold, any little bit of something that you just sort of back off and say, well, I don't know what to do about it. They're probably not going to listen to me anyway, and people often will not. Um, I'm not saying that just because they ask and you tell them what you think, if they're adults, they can do whatever they want anyway. And I'm not saying that we would not welcome people here to worship with us who hadn't seen it our way yet. But they cannot be part of some sort of close, prayerful, supported membership of our church because God says they can't. You know, he just says don't. And, and that's really the point that this man, when Paul says it's different, if it's a brother in Christ who's doing this, you, you've already let this go this long. You've really got to call sin, sin. He talks about this thing about leaven. And leaven, um, the, the NIV or some of the newer translations say that as yeast. But really, yeast that I buy in a little package at the store is pretty clean and pure. It is, you know, something that will make your bread dough rise. But at this time, what they're talking about with leaven was more like what we might call sourdough. They would save back a little lump of the dough to sit over in a spot and ferment and take a bit of that to add to their fresh dough when they made it and it would cause the dough to rise. At the time of Passover, they were taught um, to clean their whole house and make sure there was no leaven left in there and they had to start over and they started over by having flat unraised bread and that's what they ate during Passover and that was to teach them about the nature of sin and the nature of sin and why he brings it in here is to say if you just let some little thing go and think I'm not going to cause offense and be so judgmental about that He's saying it's just like that bit of really rotting dough <laughs> that you take a tiny bit and add to your fresh. And he's saying now Jesus is our Passover lamb and we're no longer celebrating Passover like that. But with our very life, don't let that old leaven exist 
you are a new fresh lump of dough. I know that's not a very flattering thing to call you, but you are a new fresh lump of dough. No sin there. When you say, Jesus, be Lord of my life, he takes away our sin. And so don't be adding a bit of that sourdough to your fresh lump that you are. Don't tolerate sin. When we tolerate just a bit of sin that we might think is not really all that bad, um, it, it lets the devil just have that little toehold and lets that grow just as the sourdough does. And, and affects other parts of our life that we would think, I would never do that, and somehow you find yourself doing that. It is important, and Paul points that out, that his word here is for the church. And I'm not going to pretend that the church has the power or the influence that it once did. Even that smaller church at Corinth was much more effective than we are here today. I don't believe in my heart that God purposely said, have denominations. I've heard that preached, that we have so many denominations because people are all so different. And there's one for whatever your personality is, and I, I think that's just not true. So we live today in 2016 in a world that we did not create, that we didn't come up with the idea, that we're just sort of thrust into that. And it would be, on our own, impossible to fix. But I think we often think of asking God for, when we say ask God for the impossible, we're praying about the small things that are bugging us in our life. And God is looking for somebody to pray the big prayers, to pray the prayers about why is there racism and hatred and war and bad stuff in our world? And not just to throw up their hands and say, well, I'm just little me, I can't do anything about that. Or why is the church so segmented and so um, one thinks they're right and the other thinks they're right and so they cannot really agree on things and so they're, we're made powerless by our, by our divisions. And we could say, well, that's something I did. I don't know. I'm just here. I'm coming to one I like, and it's all right. That's the kind of big prayer that God is calling us to pray, to say, God, what about this? I don't really think this is, is the way you saw things going. And I could not possibly do even one little thing about it other than maybe be friends with somebody in another denomination who says something mean, just still show love. You can do little things like that. But God, what is it that you see me in my life and in the church I attend and in my family and in the circles of influence that I have? Use me to make things right. Now we know that one day Jesus will come back and make things right for good and all. But that does not give us really the excuse that we've used it to just say, well, the world's going to be terrible anyway, so we expected that and I'm just not going to worry about it. It really doesn't give us that kind of thing. That's like saying, I'm just going to throw my trash on the highway because everybody else is doing it and it's a mess. Well, that answer, that kind of lazy answer about woe is me, is never the godly answer. He calls us to be, he says, salt, to be light where we go. And you cannot ignore salt. If you have water and it's salty, you'll notice that. You cannot ignore light when you're in a dark place, even a tiny candle, even a teeny little match lit. It catches people's attention. It has an effect. That's what he's called us to be in every situation that we are in. And that's why we cannot tolerate sin in our own life, in the life of a sister or brother, and that it isn't being mean to call out someone for their sin. It's being mean. It's not caring enough to mention it to you. That, that's being mean. That's showing no love, no consideration, that we will just allow people to just plod along in sin and turn our backs and not notice. That's the ultimate I don't give a care about you. 
So that's how I see um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I know that it's probably crossed some lines with you, that probably some things that you believed are true, um, you might have rather not read it, because that's how I felt when I first started studying it. I kind of wanted it to go away. <laughs> um, but that's how God's word is. He challenges us and calls us to things that are beyond our just everyday status quo. And I think he's calling us as the church to be fresh and new and open to whatever it is he speaks to us. This is how we want to do church how God sees church. We want to worship God as what is worship to God. We don't want to just be following along in a form or a tradition because that's how it's always been done.